Hello, April. Hello. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing okay. I just got dinner finished and, and have not had a chance to pull those over to where hopefully I can share them yet. Uh huh. Um, just to let you know, I am recording today. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I'll publish it. It's just I've been. It's been a while since I've recorded one of these, and on the odd chance that we actually get more than one or two people, <laughs> it might be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it can be very interesting. Um, so the Wichita Mountains yeah. are located. In what state? Oklahoma. Okay. That's an area that uh, I have not visited. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out how I can do that because I've been using Google Maps and maybe Google Earth is a different, slightly different program or something because it lists the names for some lakes but not yeah. any mountains. If you know a specific yeah. mountain, sometimes you well, get lucky. <laughs> You're dealing with something that's definitely been observed before. Um, I know that, um, yeah, a number of other people have, have commented on this, that um, it's a real shortfall of Google Earth that they don't have better data. Because a lot of people go looking there for it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, basically, with Google Maps. So, Dokin Dana, welcome aboard. Hey, Ron. How are you? Hello. How about you? All right. I am recording today, just so you're all aware of it. Awesome. No guarantee it'll actually get posted, but <laughs> just want to make sure you're aware. Indeed. Don't discuss sensitive personal matters. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me if I don't have to do any editing. <laughs> That's right. Okay, let me see. I, I, I tend to adopt the view that everything I say is public, in at least on the Internet. So um, I, I am less inhibited with um, speaking for the record. Okay, I'm going to see if I can try to do this. I don't know okay. if it will work. The uh, bed frame there makes a nice be backdrop there, Dana. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's the only oh, place in the house with sunshine, so. Yeah. Yes. Okay, April, well, we're looking at area. Yeah, I'm looking at the little green, well, actually it's a big green mountain just to the left of the Kiowa Lake. Okay. The I O W A like that looks like a very what Oklahoma interesting. Is searching on. Let me take that up here in Google Earth. Yeah, that looks like a very interesting land formation. Okay. You know, I'm wondering. Yeah. Okay, so I, like I said, I don't know this area from having been on the ground there in the past, mm -hmm. but um, this is, I believe, the region of Oklahoma where there are granites exposed. And, in fact, I see a mountain listed there. That mountain mm -hmm. is, let's see, as I zoom in on it, Elk Mountain. This is located, let's see, I'm trying to figure out exactly where we are. Elk Mountain is south of that green area that you're looking at, south of that small lake, which is unnamed. Okay. Um, but it, it's an area here. You can clearly see the jointing in Google Earth really nicely. Um, I suppose I'll bring up my Google Earth window and share this just a second. Okay. Here. Um, all right, share screen. Worth. Okay. So, are you seeing that yet from my end? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
that little green dot just above my cursor there, right around my cursor there, that's the one that was labeled Elk Mountain, and that's just that, that farsed area, that green farsed area you had in your view, April, is this uh -huh. area just to the north here. Okay. So I, now I don't know. Elk Mountain's a fairly generic sort of name. There's another mountain named here, Mount Marcy. <laughs> I laugh because, of course, I have climbed the New York Mount Marcy, which is, well, a very different experience. Anyway, um, so, yeah, we got a Mount Marcy in that area, too. I, I, so I don't know the areas from being on the ground. I have, however, in the past looked up this region because uh, Oklahoma has one of the few areas of Cambrian granite exposed in the United States, Cambrian mm -hmm. age granite. And um, I don't know very much more about it than this, but this is the right region of the state, and this is probably worth a drive down there at some point for me before I move away from Kansas. Because <laughs> um, mm. I imagine that's probably a... Uh, good days drive again drive. But, um, I've, I've not been there on the ground, so I really can't say uh, with great certainty yeah. what you're looking at. But um, yeah, okay. no, 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 there you go. Thank you. That would be worth visiting if you're in the continent. <laughs> well, at least there's some geology there. <laughs> Exposed yes. even. Yes, you know, I, I certainly had the, uh, the, the, what I think is a common misconception growing up on the East Coast and the West Coast and even learning geology on the East Coast, that everything between the Rockies and the Appalachians was basically just uh, no bedrock whatsoever, or, or it was all too deep, you know, it was like this, this layer of soil that, that a little great wheat fields and corn fields were planted in, but that there was no geology at the surface between the Rockies and the Appalachians, and I, I am very wrong. I was very <laughs> wrong about that. Um, there's still the expanses of soil in between, but um, there is uh, bedrock, and it's not that far below the surface, and sometimes it pokes itself out. Yeah, there's actually some amazing stuff, which I never knew about, because, you know, my experience was with Indiana around Terre Haute, and that's cornfields. Yep. Yes. Entries. There's no question that, yes, there are particular areas of the Midwest uh, and the Great Plains that, that actually earn the distinction of being Great Plains. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. That are, in fact, you know, flatter than a pancake. Um, more than just an aggregate. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, there are parts of central, yeah, central Illinois is one of those areas that, well, not all of central Illinois, because there are a few actual neat things around uh, normal, for example. But, um, yeah, there are just some big flat stretches there of glacial outwash. Um, even Iowa is not that flat. <laughs> <laughs> the Central Valley of California, however, is, oh, God. is flat. Boy, oh, boy. Oh, we drove through that coming up here, and it was just mile upon mile upon mile of just flat agricultural land. Yep. Boring as hell. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, by the time we got through that, we were about ready to shoot ourselves. And then you get up into the Redding area with yeah. Shasta and oh, it was worth it all. Great relief. Yeah, the one, the one um, saving grace of the, the Central Valley of California is that no matter where you are along its length, you're only two or three hours from a mountain chain in one direction or another. Right, right. Um, even if you can't necessarily see them because of the smog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that problem. So, Doug, what's on your mind? We haven't talked in a while. I've got a question about, am I saying this right, Plinian volcanoes. Ooh. Oh, excellent. I got, I like a, I got this dead geology oh. book from my daughter. It's a coffee table book from the uh, Smithsonian. Yeah. She knows how much I like oh, these neat. hangouts. 
So now I've got a new source mm -hmm. of questions for you. Excellent. Um, but my question is, can they form below the ocean? Can you have those big explosive volcanoes? So the answer to this is, is multi-part. If I had to give you a one-word answer, it would be no. But there are certainly qualifiers. In, in general, um, that style of volcanic eruption, plenty of eruptions, are associated with um, intermediate to felsic compositions of magma. Uh, that is the type of magma that is most commonly produced in continental volcanic arcs. Uh, South American, the Andes, for example, um, in the Cascades, uh, you have this sort of thing. Uh, really all of the classic volcanic arcs that you tend to think about, but um, also island arcs, and so here's where we're getting a little bit more toward your oceanic sort of situation. The Aleutian Islands, for example, have a number of volcanoes, not all of them, but a number of them that are certainly capable of this style of eruption. Uh, you know, historically we've had a number on the Alaska Peninsula that have erupted this way. Uh, in fact, even, um, I guess it's two summers ago now, two, maybe three summers ago now, Kasatochi out in the western Aleutian Islands had one of these eruptions. Um, and in this sort of a situation, you're dealing with volcanoes that are you know, at sea level or above sea level. Um, but in those oceanic island arcs, uh, you can have shallow submarine volcanoes that would be capable of this as well. And I think probably the best example, I don't know if there are any historical eruptions of these guys, the, the Itsubonan uh, island arc uh, south of Japan, um, including such subaerial islands as Iwo Jima, for example, uh, there are a number of um, caldera complexes capable of a big plenty of eruption that are just shallowly submarine in that arc. Okay. Um, I, I should also say that, you know, okay, another historical example that really almost fits this is um, the eruption of Krakatoa mm -hmm. in 1983. Um, it, it, was, it was clearly an island, and the initial eruption is from on the island itself, but it essentially blew away the island. Right, right such that the vent, and Santorini is another one in the Mediterranean, uh, which was you know, Thera um, and the extinction of the Minoan civilization. These are, these are large, essentially sea level type eruptions um, that um, in both of those cases they blew away the island, but the subsequent volcanism is coming up from that caldera, and so it, it's starting in a submarine environment. Uh, you would not get a Plinian eruption in the deep oceans. Uh, even if you had, well, A, you don't generally have those magmas produced in the deep oceans. Right. And this has mostly to do with um, you need to basically allow the magma to evolve or mix with continental materials okay. uh, in order for it to get to these highly explosive states. And, and in the deep oceans where you're dealing with ocean-ocean divergence, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, you may produce a little bit of rhyolite in some of those situations. There is some in Iceland. Uh, but even Iceland is an anomaly for the mid-ocean ridges. And, um, and under high pressures, under seawater, you would just not get a big eruption plume. That's what I want. Just all the pressure would... Exactly. In fact, the, the, the eruption in El Hierro off the, in the Canary Islands is a prime example of this right now. Uh, this has been erupting for about two months now uh, in a shallow submarine vent. The, the vent is, uh, well, the, the bathymetry in the area suggests that it, it began erupting in a spot about 200 meters deep. Uh, and since it began erupting, it has grown about 40 meters. Wow. And, and now, I mean, it's undoubtedly producing lava flows and such on the sea floor. Uh, and you get all this discoloration of the water above that, uh, but you essentially, lovely picture there, of, uh, is that Krakatoa? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Ricotta? Yeah. Or, oh. 
Uh, yeah, that's that's probably uh, what's the um, Anak Kragaton. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, at any rate, um, the um, the eruption of El Hierro is is basically still submarine as it's produced uh, the the big um, discoloration um, staining sort of plume in the waters there, but has not. Um, really put out any ash to speak of. Okay. Um, eventually, if that were to continue building, and I think El Hierro will probably, uh, or, or that eruption at El Hierro will probably die before it gets to the stage, but uh, if it continues to build and gets shallower and shallower, once it gets to about, uh, I forget what the actual depth is usually, but when it's about 15 meters or, or shallower, uh, it might have enough explosive force to uh, begin um, doing these, these rooster tails as fountaining, uh, and eventually uh, would grow into a certain say an eruption and, and um, something like that. There is actually some spectacular YouTube footage. Um, probably if you search on rooster tails <laughs> in, in YouTube, uh, you may get rooster tails. I don't know, <laughs> but, but the volcanic <laughs> rooster tails anyway. Um, there, there was this uh, shallow uh, subsea eruption in Tonga, in the Tonga volcanic arc, um, again, two or three summers ago, and uh, somebody yachted right up to this thing and, oh. and got some video from not far away. Far enough that they, they got away with bringing the video back, fortunately. Um, yeah. The, the, the classic Pliny eruption, you, you basically have to have a sub-aerial interface uh, for it to erupt. Okay. And because um, just the weight of even even a few tens of meters of ocean water is enough to really suppress that. I, I suppose a large cold air eruption, if you had a really, really violent eruption, you might be able to... Um, you know, blast from maybe a hundred meters or so deep, but much beyond that, and just the sheer weight of the water is going to be enough to um, flood back in and suppress the. Wasn't there? But, Ron? Yeah. Wasn't there a, an article a while ago where um, they were talking about finding evidence of explosive volcanism under the Arctic, under the Arctic ice? In the along um, the ocean ridge somewhere. So I don't recall it was, a lot of articles, and, and it would not terribly surprise me to find some explosive. I mean, certainly you can have explosive eruptions from a uh, uh, groundwater or seawater interruption uh, interaction with lava, um, but I don't know. You, you might indeed be correct, and there might be something there. I, I don't. Uh, no, what do you remember about it? I just remember it was, um, I think it was on the Silent, Science Daily, there was a, an article, it's, it was a couple of years ago, talking about, um, it was the, the first evidence of um, explosive volcanism at depth, but I don't know, um, I don't know what, I can't remember much about the details. I, I have to I'll say, Google it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a good one, and you know, there's, um, I don't have it at my fingertips, but one of the uh, volcanology books, I think by Decker or Decker and Decker, uh, I know has a, a chapter. This is one of these um, volcanology books that's aimed at kind of an intro geology sort of audience. And I know that I had a professor who used that to teach a kind of volcanoes and civilizations class. Uh, it has a chapter on hydrothermal volcanism, or not hydrothermal, uh, shallow submarine type volcanism has a really nice picture of the, the styles of eruptions. You can actually get explosive eruptions in the subsea where they, they form kind of a bubble over uh -huh. the over, over the vent um, where the you know the water pressure is pressing in on this but if it's got enough energy uh, blasting out of the uh, crater caldera you can actually form this kind of vent around the or, or bubble around the vent. Uh, but eventually that will collapse because the, the pressure of the ocean water is too strong. Kathy, you got more? Pardon? Did you, did you Google anything? Did you find anything? 
I was listening to you. Sorry. Yeah, okay. No, that's all right. Um, yeah, I think basically, you know, once you get to deeper depths, um, there's just not enough, even with all the violence of, of a volcanic eruption, you're under high enough pressures that, in, in part, I think what's happening in those in the deeper waters is even mm -hmm. though you've got a fair amount of gas dissolved in that um, magma, um, you know, what really drives a volcanic eruption is that gas coming out of solution, much like opening up a, uh, a soda bottle, right? You know, when you're, when you're under pressure, all that gas, carbon dioxide in the case of Minnesota, is dissolved in the, or beer, right? I mean, mm -hmm. guess, you know, beer is what we know. But, you know, champagne would be another good example of this. When you're under pressure, you've got dissolved gases in the, in the magma. Um, but as you release the pressure, those gases come out of solution. That vesiculation process, the forming of vesicles, is really what drives the vast expansion of this magma and drives then the eruption. Um, the fact is, if you remain under a fair amount of pressure, and even water pressure in this case, uh, you don't even get that, that big vesiculation. And so even though there's energy driving that eruption, uh, as the magma expands, it doesn't expand nearly as violently as you would get in a Plinian style eruption. All right, and Kathy shared that link. So I'm following that to see what we got. Carry on, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just, um, yeah. yeah. Just an article about the um, pyroclast. Excellent. I'll have to read up on this one. The Gecko Ridge. That is Arctic. That is high Arctic. All right. Well, that's reading for afterwards. But but uh, I'll definitely be curious to read about that one. Uh, you know, the Gecko Ridge, well, A, I don't know very much about it, except it's an extension of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, but there's a couple of different ridges in the Arctic Ocean, and at least one of them, and that's not the Geckel Ridge, I think it's, it's the other one, uh, is actually a continental fragment, not actually um, mid-ocean ridge related. Uh, I think it's actually that continental fragment that is the one that they're targeting for oil exploration, um, where, where the Russians have been so excited to put their little flag on the sea floor down there. <laughs> The, the Lazbala Ridge, if I recall correctly, is the name of that other one. But I don't know. Yeah, my, um, I'm interested to find out more about the Northern Hemisphere geology because I know very little about it. Well, <laughs> we, are, we are glad to have you along because all, most of my knowledge is Northern Hemisphere geology and I, I lack a lot of knowledge of the Southern Hemisphere. Or at least it's not what I grew up learning about. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank goodness for the internet. <laughs> really, it's 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 rather amazing to be. I mean, yes, we have to shuffle with the time zones and stuff like that. But boy, oh boy, it is neat to to talk to people who have a whole different background. It is. It's very interesting. Yep. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, the northern hemisphere, what can I tell you? Our shadows all point to the north. <laughs> That's different, right? Yeah. <laughs> the water flashes the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> Except it's the right way up here. <laughs> what I can't understand is how all you folks in the southern hemisphere stay on the planet. Don't just fall. <laughs> uh, especially in Australia, it's it's hard clinging. Yeah, you know, we have uh, quite good grip with our toes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you know there was uh, what's the the new um, there's an Antarctic blog that just uh, I started following just a few weeks ago, and he posted a whole bunch of South Pole pictures, and he posted one of them in the proper orientation, yeah. uh, with the sky downwards. Um, oh, yeah. and then he posted the others all, all upside down so the rest of us wouldn't have such a hard time 
are relating to them. <laughs> uh, it was just in, in one of the posts today or yesterday. I won't be able to dig it up real quick. Cool. Yeah, I've seen some of those Australian uh, maps of the world. Um, yeah. where, where south is up. Yes. Totally bizarre. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've seen a couple of postcards of them. They're quite funny. Yes. Uh, what else? We've got Cambrian grants. We've got subsea plane eruptions. Dana, you must have a question of some sort. No? Um, I've been very immersed in writing lately. That's good. That's <laughs> so good. much researching, but yeah, I went to the uh, Pitch 2.0 thing. and Yes, and this is the Amazon thing, right? Yeah, Amazon and Create Space, which anybody wanting to write a book, no matter what it is, fiction, nonfiction, um, it's just, it's a fantastic outlet that we don't have to rely on publishers anymore. There are all these tools to allow us to do what publishers used to do. So it's pretty amazing. It was a great conversation. In terms of the publishing tools, what about the editing tools? Are they there as well? Um, that I haven't looked into quite as much. Um, mostly your, they've got some on Create Space that should help. Um, mostly you're looking into um, uploading your file and getting it distributed. Um, there are also a lot of resources. There's actually a couple of people who have been by the blog who do things like editing the book, and they do nonfiction as well as fiction. Um, they help you design covers. They help you do line editing. They help you with all of those things that a traditional publisher would normally take care of. Yeah. So there's all kinds of resources out. I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking that just without having actually read your article. Sorry there. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, well, when, I, when I think of Amazon, I think of certainly they have the distribution end of things covered. Oh, yeah, they've got that a lot. You know, the, um, the ability to put it into a print format, bind a book, is not a terribly hard thing for them to coordinate. But when I think about, you know, a publisher and what does a publisher do for you, uh, the distribution is one part of it, but also the editing and the, the typesetting and, and all those other sorts of things, which I, I didn't have much of appreciation of until, well, I mean, the editing certainly I have some appreciation of because I've submitted papers for publication. The appreciation is not exactly an appreciation. It's an <laughs> understanding more than an appreciation. But nonetheless, um, uh, my, my, my point was simply, actually, in reading uh, Sue Charman's uh, blog, um, and, and I'm going to draw a quick blank on the name of that, but uh, oh, chocolate and vodka, uh, talking about her experience with um, publishing Arbleton, um, it, it, it sounds like there, there's quite a few other things that one does not necessarily think of as being part of the publisher's um, tool set that in fact are not easy to cut out of the whole process. Anyway, I'm... I would think the marketing would be, would be tough. You know, the right? marketing it's, is something that publishers always tell you they're going to do for you, and they don't do anything more than you can do. Really? The best they can do for you is maybe get a mention in the New York Times. And that's only if, you know, you're one of their big authors. They're not going to do that for an unknown. Uh, right. Most of the marketing stuff you still have to do on your own as a writer. So considering that a publisher will take a 52% cut of an ebook, leaving you with 17%, wow. the other 30% or so going to the distributors, they're not offering enough bang for the buck is what it's coming down to. So a lot of people are choosing to go independent um, that's one of the things that I'm looking into because it just seems ridiculous to sign away rights, not have control over my works. When I can do it all myself, I can do the print book. There's Create Space. Um, there's others available, you know, like Lulu, if you decide that you don't want Amazon to have control over your entire life. 
um, you can directly upload your ebook to Kindle and Smashwords and Barnes and Noble, all of those things. Um, you can handle the audiobooks. There's Audible now. Yep. You can handle everything, and you can get an agent for things like foreign rights. You don't need a publisher necessarily, and they're becoming less and less relevant as time goes on. It, this is an interesting thing because I, I, I'm certainly with you on, on all of that, and I'm also looking at this, though, trying to look at this through a publisher's sort of viewpoint. Uh, for example, for, like, uh, journal publications. Um, you know, it, it's one thing if you're looking for kind of a mass audience or you don't care the size of the audience or, or what. Um, when you're dealing with, like, scientific article publications, uh, I certainly, I feel like, you know, uh, yeah, I want open access. I want, you know, people to just, to some degree, just post them on their blogs and, you know, get get the peer review, yes. But, yeah. you know, the, the publisher does as much of a disservice by putting these things behind a paywall. Oh, you know? absolutely. In fact, mm -hmm. when this, this is a, a tough sort of argument, but... On the other hand, what the publisher does do is is he gets the, uh, into print and distribution. I mean, certainly in, in terms of an established scientific publisher, there is a paper copy, and there's a lot of value to be had in that paper copy, the distribution to libraries and things like that. Now, that's not primarily what the publisher is doing, but I, I'm thinking like you know, you know, the Geological Society of America, for example, publishing its journals is a non-profit publisher, so they're not there. It's not like an Elsevier where they're they're just making money for the shareholders. Right. Um, they do certainly add values um, that would be hard to duplicate if you were to just simply take it on yourself to try and self-publish. Um, I don't know. This is one of those things where, I mean, I, I, for, for your situation, Dan, I think, you know, uh, self-publishing is, is a real uh, a real good idea. Yeah, for and, that, for people wanting to write, you know, yes. books on popular science, um, yes. science for a lay audience, even science for a professional audience where they're writing a book, not necessarily a paper. Right. Um, papers, I think that you're going to probably see it start to happen in the academic publishing world what's happened on the popular publishing world where you will end up with someone who basically revolutionizes it like Amazon has done for book distributing. Yeah. You know, the old model of doing things, it's, it's not the way it has to be. Right. And it's not perfect, and there are enough people and enough technology now to be able to figure out a better way and still keep the quality, still keep the peer review, improve peer review. I mean, we've seen what happens. And certainly improve access. And that, that, that's the yeah. biggest thing from a journal perspective that I would really like to see them do. And there's, there's no reason they couldn't, well, I, I see no reason they couldn't be doing this. I don't know the whole process there. And I, that's one of those things where I, I'm hesitant to make too bold a statement there, but right. you know, I can't imagine like the Geological Society of America makes a great deal of money off of publications older than about five years old. Right. Um, and, and why why those would be you know maintained? Yes, there's a cost in putting those things into a digital format because they were not originally in a digital format. Um, but why that cost isn't just swallowed or uh, you know fold it into the cost of operations, and then those things are not then made free. I, I, I am really at a loss to figure out why that hasn't been a priority for a society whose goal is to, you know, disseminate knowledge, disseminate understanding of that. Um, you know, I don't understand the economics behind the whole thing. Maybe they do make a fair amount of money on this. Maybe they do have hopes to make more money on this. But I would really love to see them do, I mean, just, I'm taking GSA because I'm, I'm thinking about them in particular, but but this could apply to a lot of different organizations. Um, I have this, I, I have dozens of uh, boxes downstairs, which were previously in my office at, at Fort Hayes, 
uh, of my journals. Uh, and I have, you know, GSA bulletin and geology going back to the 1950s. Well, GSA, uh, geology only started publishing in the 1970s. But basically, I, I have GSA bulletin going back to the 1950s. I hate to have to move those every time I have to move somewhere because it's a big expense. Those things are heavy. Yeah. They take up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, I am very low to uh, consider actually uh, you know, getting rid of those. And I know, I, I mean, I've inherited those from the 1950s, not because I was around subscribing at the time, because I've inherited them from other people who, um, you know, got rid of their collection. But I would desperately love to have that all in a um, in an online or better still, just a, a set of DVDs. Uh, you know, National Geographic seems to be a, a good model for this. Uh, they put, you know, the all the National Geographic stuff there. Definitely getting a lot of sound from the uh, kind of background sound. Okay, sorry, I've got earphones in, so I don't know why. Oh. Yeah, I don't know, but it's picking up a lot of background sound. I'm doing just <laughs> so you know, maybe you want to mute between speaking. Okay. Um, okay. Right. Um, so, I mean, National Geographic, you can buy sets of DVDs or a hard drive with scanned copies of all the things from, you know, 1888 up until, you know, the present day, more or less. And, and I, I, I recently guess, bought that. It's really good. Yeah. yeah I got it, too. That's one of my favorite things ever. I really <laughs> wish that, that um, GSA would, would do something like that. I mean, that's one thing where I could see them actually making some money off of their old uh, things and then solving a problem for all of us who, uh, you know, have these these piles of journals and um, mm -hmm. I just would love to part with them. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's first world problems. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, what do you write? Oh. Uh, variety of things. Right now I'm in my fiction writing stage of the year, so working on the whole science fiction opus. Um, in the summertime I try to concentrate more on nonfiction and geology. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how long it takes before something's in publishable shape. But, <laughs> yeah. Between that and the blog, that's, that's a pretty fair overview of what I do. Blogs take a lot of time. <laughs> oh, God. It's like yeah. dealing well, with a two-year-old. Yeah, actually, like, <laughs> <laughs> like Dana does. Uh, if your blog sits fallow for, for months on end, then it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's time at all. It's like, I don't know what you people are talking about. It takes time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd be curious, Dana, what, what do you think? Let's say, you know, five or six years from now, everybody's got Kindles. We're getting all of our writing content electronically. You think we'll have more people able to earn a living as a writer oh, or, or fewer? Absolutely more. We're seeing it now. I mean, we're only a couple years into this revolution. Things are completely different now from the way they were three years ago. Um, and we are seeing authors make a tremendous amount of money selling a, an electronic book for two ninety nine, two ninety nine or three ninety nine. Okay. Uh, there's there's one um, J A Conrath who is actually he's gone from making forty thousand dollars a year as a traditionally published thriller writer. He's now in the top one percent. He is one of the one percent now. He is in the top one percent tax bracket. Because he has started self-publishing, he just put out, he, he actually has a good example uh, that I was just reading on his blog. He had published one book in a series traditionally, and in two years it made $60,000, which is an amazing amount for a mid-list thriller title. Wow. That's really good money. Uh, they passed on the next two books in that series, so he self-published them himself for two ninety nine dollars apiece. In one year, those two books combined have made $170,000. So, yes, more authors are going to be making money. More authors are going to be able to actually quit their job and make a living. More readers are actually going to be able to read this stuff. 
he had the advantage there. Yes. I mean, the, the reason I, I asked is I just, you know, people expect everything on the internet to be free, right? I can, there's plenty of content I can. Yeah, yeah but ebooks are different. Right. You know, there's an expectation that when an author has spent years writing something, you're going to pay for it. It's not auto work. <laughs> On your side? Sorry, go ahead. No, I was asking you what you were about to say. No, I was going to say, you know, I, I, I definitely agree there. And, and my, my point earlier was that, you know, his experience there that you cited, um, he had already a certain amount of audience from the traditional publishing process. Right. Uh, and and the, the non-traditional built that audience more probably than the traditional process would have, right. uh, but he did have that, that initial seed. But um, there's also other authors who have started out with nothing. Um, I can't remember her last name, but there's a uh, woman named Amanda who just signed a traditional contract. A million dollars, yeah. Right. Because she had sold like a million dollars, you know, she had sold so many ebooks, but she started from the ground up. She had no publisher. She had no traditional experience. Readers found her and loved her, and that was what propelled her to success. She didn't need to sign a contract. Right. She just kind of wanted that traditional publisher cachet, so yeah. to speak. By the way, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying don't do this in any way. I, 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 I'm, I'm, if anything, playing devil's advocate here. Okay. <laughs> that, that's that's what makes it fun. Well, I, I realize, but I mean, it's... I would love to see more of this sort of publishing, and I, I am definitely convinced that there is a future for it. Um, that it has not, well, I, I just, you know, want to also put the brakes on and say those are outstanding examples, oh, but yes. it's not 100% of the examples out there either. No, but the thing is, there are still, and, and this has been discussed in the book blogosphere, mm -hmm. um, you know, those are exceptional examples, but they show that it works. You know, you've got most of the people in the kind of, you know, they're never going to succeed because they don't put in the time, they don't put in the effort, they don't have the right product, they don't say things that other people want to hear. You know, they're, they're not writing things that people want to read. Or if they are, they're not getting it in front of eyeballs that want to read it, and they just don't get any momentum. And that same group is still going to be there. They are always going to be there. Yeah. But you have more opportunity for what's traditionally been known as the mid-list. Yes. You know, people that a sizable chunk like, but just didn't make enough money to interest the publishing houses, they're going to be able to get their stuff out in front of readers, and that's, that's taking off. We're already seeing that happen. It's, and there's more people who can succeed than before. Yep. So, you yep. know, it's always going to be, I mean, just like with blogging, just because you write the blog doesn't mean you're going to be successful and everybody will right. come and everybody loves you and you're just amazing. Yes. You have to work hard at it and you have to give readers something to come back for. Mm -hmm. I hear Poppy. <laughs> Gina, is that your puppy or is that somebody yeah, else's puppy? puppy? I'm trying to catch him so I can. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Here's my puppy. Oh, hi, your puppy. <laughs> I, just, I just got home and he wants some attention. Oh. That's what it is. He's adorable. <laughs> so he knows. Uh, he, I am recording this just, just so he knows and doesn't forget. Oh, okay. It. Just so you're aware. <laughs> anyway, I will stop monopolizing the conversation. Let's. Uh, no, 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 that. that's fine. It, it's okay. <laughs> um, I asked for your input there, and I, I'm glad we have it because I, it, it's a good subject, and it's, it's definitely one that, that um, yeah. We can go on a long time about. There, there's a lot of good stuff there, and and you know you're doing it well. You you you're you're building that audience. I can tell you already before we've seen any of your books, but um, you definitely 
working that nicely. Well, what was funny at the Pitch 2.0 event is one of the things they were talking about was your platform. They're like, you need to do this and this and this and this. I'm like, done it, done it, done it, done it, done it. Check, check. check. <laughs> Maybe I should finish the book now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one other thing I did want to mention, and this is relevant to anyone who wants to write about science, it can be very hard to pitch a book to a publisher about a science subject. Um, you know, getting people, getting a traditional publisher interested in, in something that they don't think that a lot of people are going to buy is extremely difficult. And if you're not like, like Phil Plate, where you have a TV show and all this popularity, you know, trying to get something technical and obscure publish is going to be next to impossible. But with self-publishing, we're going to be able to write these things that interest us and that will interest other people in our community. There were 20,000 people at the American Geophysical Union. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me that they wouldn't be interested in, in an affordable book. Now, mind you, affordable is key because when I've seen, you know, serious scientific treatises, they're usually priced in the hundreds of dollars. <laughs> But, you know, a book priced, you know, maybe around 10 or 15 bucks that discusses a fairly technical subject that maybe only a few thousand people want to read. In the old days, that would have never gotten off the ground. Today, you can pop that up and have people be able to download it. You can sort of make a living at it, and you're good to go. Yep. You know, there's, there's more things that can be said things that will make it past the gates that never would have made it before. So I, I do challenge anybody in the room who's uh, into science and maybe maybe thinking they might be into writing to try it, go for it. And there are people out there who can help the independent person actually get that book distributed at very reasonable prices, I might add. So it, it's worth it. Yeah, with the Amazon thing, um, they're presumably just involved in the distribution end of things primarily. They're not asking for your copyright in order to, to publish that, are they? Oh, no. No, no. no Amazon, that. you retain all of your rights. They take no rights from you whatsoever. They are taking a cut specifically to distribute, that's and that's it. You retain all rights. Um, there's some things like Amazon now has a publishing arm where, yes, you will be signing a contract and you will be giving up certain rights to the book, but their contract is much better than traditional publishing houses. Much. much. And you can read it. Yes. As opposed to these others. One of the one of the more frustrating things about the scientific publication, the journal literature, uh, is... Um, and, and I bucked at this long before online publishing was even an option, but when I was first dealing with this, the, the concept of signing away your, your copyright uh, just rankled me to no end um, because, um, well, partially in my mind, copyright is reserved for the authors, not for somebody else. Um, but um, the, 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 the real problem with it is that, you know, once you've signed that away, uh, your rights to redistribute your own work uh, are now uh, limited by the publisher. I mean, they generally allow you to post a PDF of the work on your website, um, but, you know, it's, it's not like it's free to, for you to make thousands of copies of them and distribute them widely. Uh, and, in fact, this is... is very much, I would say, a hindrance to science more than oh, a, yeah. a positive thing. Um, so that's definitely an area where, yeah. I, I would love to see that change. Yes. Because it's ridiculous that, you know, in my situation, I have no school that I'm affiliated with. Mm -hmm. I am far from rich. <laughs> and to see so much stuff published that would be wonderful to read it would increase my knowledge, make me a lot more scientifically literate. To see all of this stuff out there, and it's stuck behind paywalls, you know, yeah, yeah. completely unaffordable stuff. I mean, thirty-five dollars for this this six-page paper isn't really the best investment. No, 
right. for somebody in my situation. And, you know, when the authors can't freely distribute their own stuff, yeah. Yeah. Although, I, I, I should say... Or it's located only well, across the country. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Most, most authors will willingly share their PDFs. It's just that right. what openly is really the problem. I mean, yeah, who, the who follows the geology conversation on Twitter will know that when somebody runs into a, a publication that they don't have access to, uh, it's usually a matter of saying, "Hey, I need a copy of this DOI. Can you? Can anybody help me with this?" And very quickly, there are people filling in the gap and and, and filling that in, uh, you know, pitching that in. Um, oh yeah, I've used that really nice quite a few times. <laughs> which is yeah, nice to see. Uh, although technically, yeah, it's um, well. <laughs> a legal fine line. Right. That's why I try not to ask very often, but again, that's restricting the amount of knowledge I have available. Yeah. And that's anathema to me. If if we're paying through our taxes for this research, um, and if scientists are pouring so much of their lives into it, they should be able to share it as they see fit. Yes, I, I I agree to a degree on all of that, and, and you know, <laughs> the the scientists um, who publish this get no compensation other than the distribution mm-hmm. for this. Really, that that's um, <laughs> scientists. Yeah, if you're looking for what the scientists should be entitled to, uh, you know, compensation for the actual work would actually be nice. Wouldn't yeah, but but um, I, I, I hesitate to ask for that because that, that'll only increase costs at this point. Um, yeah. Any any other geology questions on your minds? Gina, you have anything? I saw your pictures. What did I miss? Um, the picture that I posted today with the uh, announcement was a picture of some mafic dikes in um, the coast on the coast of Maine. Okay. Let me pull that up real quickly here, um, or maybe not. Um, <laughs> there they are, and now I got to share that screen. And come on, share the screen. I remember how to do this. Really, I do. <laughs> Share select window. There it is. So if you've seen that now, yeah. So this is actually um, this is Shudik Point on the uh, Atlantic coast of Maine, and these are big uh, basaltic dikes that intruded at the uh, time of the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so they're about 200 million year old dikes, uh, kind of Jurassic Triassic boundary. Age. They're intruded into Devonian granites here, um, and uh, this was just a foggy day when I got out there to shoot a point, which was really disappointing. I was hoping to shoot all kinds of nice gigapans of this, and eh, not so much. Actually, was this before my last? This is before I actually had the gigapan, but I was I was hoping to do a lot more photography of this area with some nice, crisp, clean, scientifically useful photos. But uh, anyway, I got more artistic photos. Um, anyway, big, big uh, basaltic dikes that are intruded into the uh, coastal batholiths there. And, um, you see these in Acadia National Park as well. But Shudik Point is just uh, famous for, for a lot of beautiful exposures. I actually did part of my uh, geology field camp one year uh, doing a mapping exercise on these dikes, which was kind of fun because there's, there's like two, at least two generations of dikes here. Um, some big, fat, wide ones and some narrower ones. And it's a good example of cross-cutting relations. I love seeing so that was that. Normally, the ones that you see all over the place. So that's great. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, 
like I said, I am recording this one, so as far as the, the previous conversation, you'll be able to pick that up because I think we had some good conversations here, so I'll probably upload this one when we're done. Um, but uh, some nice conversations about uh, plenty of eruptions and what else did we talk about? There were, uh, well, um, good, 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 good books and publishing as well. Yeah. <laughs> And a little bit of the geology of Oklahoma. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. We started, off with, we started off with Cambrian granites in Oklahoma. Yes. <laughs> Which I think we should all take a field trip to someday. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, this is one that's not terribly far. I just got to find the motivation to go out there for it. The idea of driving down to Oklahoma is one of those things that. <laughs> you know. Now, having driven through the Midwest, I can see where the lack of motivation may come from. <laughs> um, you know, I haven't been there. Maybe I'll be vastly surprised by it when I get there and say, why, you know, why haven't I been coming here? It's also southern Oklahoma, which is a little bit further away from me, but um, that's okay. April, have you actually been there? No, I haven't. Okay. I've been in Texas and Florida. Or, yeah, I guess I've been in Florida. I don't remember it, but Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio. Okay. I like writing about out west, though, where it's warmer. <laughs> uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yep. Let's see. If anybody wanted to discuss them, um, let me grab... The link, as I saw, I don't know if anybody else saw the astronomy picture of the day with the thin sections from Vesta, which were absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, not, not from Vesta, but from Vesta-like asteroids. Right, <laughs> right. They, they were gorgeous, and, and they were uh, kerosene rich. <laughs> oh, they were fantastic. Is that like where they did the... Moon eclipse. So they did all the different stages of it, or is that a different one? No, no, this is different. The um, okay. the astronomy picture they were referring to has uh, thin sections. These are actually um, thin slices of rock. Uh, oh, and this okay. Came from from uh, meteorites, uh, and the meteorites are thought because of their spectral appearance. There they are. Cool. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yeah, yeah lovely. Uh, so what you're looking at in those um, is is almost well, it's mostly pyroxene, would be my guess. And the grays and the light yellows are probably clinopyroxene, and the the blues and the uh, the deeper colors would probably be clinopyroxenes. Anyway, that's what my best guess is without a actual thin section on stage to interpret. Uh, one of the things that I was noticing in the description, um, you know, it was saying part of the group classified as HED, Howardite, um, Eucrate, Diogenite, yep. or Diogenite. I yep. can't pronounce this stuff because yeah, I you know, it. never hear it. Um, but, you know, that intrigued me because I, I not really, I guess it had never really caught my attention before. Um, you know, what, what are these things, this, this Howardite and Eucrite and Diogenite? I can't speak from the experience of a uh, person who studied meteorites extensively, but as an igneous uh, petrologist, uh, these are basically um, plutonic, mafic igneous rocks. They're similar to the deeper portions of the oceanic crust, uh, some portions of the continental crust, perhaps. Um, and this is similar in general composition, overall composition to, well, similar to the, the, the bulk composition of the um, oceanic crust in general, uh, which is probably similar to the uh, surface expression of, of most planetary bodies in the rocky portions of the solar system. 
Um, I don't know the, the specific uh, distinction between the, the Hollow Knight and the Great Cloud. Ben, uh, welcome aboard, Gary. You've got a lot of microphone noise. Um, yeah. Uh, Ben? Yeah. Could you mute yourself when you're not talking? I need to chat. There we go. I did it. <laughs> so, at any rate, you know, these, um, you know, without having actually uh, dug into the specifics of this, um, these look like a lot of the thin sections from layered mythic intrusions. Um, that that I that you study as a petrologist, you know, learning about uh, uh, petrography. Um, they're pretty to look at, no question about that. Oh yeah, yes for sure. I think maybe one of the the features of this, and and I, again, I'm just glancing at the the pictures right now, but it certainly does look like um, these are somewhat brecciated. There's some amount of crushing of those samples, more on the one on the left, I think, than on the one on the right. Um, I, I could be mistaken about that. Maybe that's just the fragmentary nature of the meteorite. Are these meteorites ones that are found on the Earth, or is this...? Yeah, not, not recovered by any space missions. Okay. Um, the, so there could be burning and, and that kind of stuff getting entry into? You would see that uh, the the thin edges of the meteorite, but you really don't see that here. Um, I don't think that's evident in any of these um, pictures. Most meteorites they get a very thin melt film as they re-enter through the atmosphere, uh, but that wouldn't actually be particularly visible in this sort of a view for a thin section. For one thing, it would be basically black. So the rim of this may be in part the melted margin, although it doesn't have to be. Um, but these are definitely Earth meteorites, and I can say that with confidence because basically the only samples we would have thin sections of are either Earth meteorites or lunar return samples from the Apollo missions. <coughs> Actually, I guess the Russians had a robotic mission that returned samples from the moon as well. Um, there have been, well, okay, and I should say there have been satellite missions that, or, or not satellites so much as uh, space missions, uh, space probes that have gone through the the uh, dust trail of comets and um, yeah, I guess the dust trail of comets is really all they've encountered that in deep space and they brought back uh, extraterrestrial dust which includes olivine grains and things like that but uh, no large rock samples so the only the only rock samples that we actually have that would make a thin section like this of would be either terrestrial samples, which may have an extraterrestrial origin if they're meteorites, but um, that or the lunar samples from Apollo, which would probably look a lot like this, at least the lunar highland samples. I guess one of the, the petrologically interesting things about these samples is that they are so pyroxene rich and, and lacking in plagioclase. Uh, Plagioclase would generally have a really distinct zebra striping sort of appearance on a thin section, and I don't see any evidence of that here. Um, also, not much olivine. There might be some on the right hand sample, but um, it seems like these guys are mostly pyroxene. That would make it a little bit interesting petrologically. Um, in fact, as I recall, eucrites are just peroxinoids or peroxinites, something like that. But, um, yeah, don't know much more than that. Okay. Now that's, that's why we need to get uh, our, uh, glacial till in here sometime. Yes, 
Yes, <laughs> uh, Ryan would be a good resource for this sort of thing. As oh, fantastic. I would these things on a more regular basis. I, you know, I, I could probably do a little bit of research on my own and, and find out a lot more, um, but just um, I'm going off the top of my head. Does it say what the scale bars are on those two? Um, hang on a second because I can grab that from the screen. Uh, two millimeters. Oh, they're not that big. So these no. are small fragments. Yeah. Yeah, if that's two millimeters, that's a pretty small fragment. Uh, you know, not tiny. Have you paid attention to the massive amounts of moon rocks missing? <laughs> um, no, not that much. Uh, certainly not as much as NASA paid attention to it. Uh, I, I know this makes the news every once in a while because um, I gather, well, A, NASA is very, very um, careful about those samples. Mm -hmm. A, when you think about the investment of taxpayer dollars that were put into that, they have every reason to be very careful about that. But what happened is I think after the Apollo program, a lot of, um, just as a, I don't know how best to characterize this as a PR stunt or whatever, but um, not a PR stunt really so much as a, a well, basically, I think the the uh, U.S. made a decision to make gifts of lunar samples to just about every nation on Earth, mm. uh, and these were mostly little fragments that I guess were deemed to have little scientific value or or little scientific value beyond uh, what was already in NASA's vaults, and so. Uh, gifts were made to a lot of different countries, and some of these countries, of course, put these in national museums and have kept a nice tight control on them. Others, you know, the dictator put it in their personal collection, and then it went into private hands when the dictator was deposed or killed or what have you, and so a couple of them have, have fallen into private hands. Uh, in the U.S., it's illegal to privately own um, a lunar sample brought back from um, the Apollo missions, um, but of course elsewhere in the world these things are in circulation and some people have tried selling them on eBay and um, mm -hmm. that's raised all kinds of hackles and um, you certainly wouldn't want a big black market in these things just from a research standpoint. I know that actually if you if you get lunar samples from um, from NASA to, to do research on you, they have a very, very strict chain of command. Um, you have um, you have to basically have a safe that you can store these things in. Uh, you have to have a a uh, like uh, affidavit, written, signed chain of of possession all the way through, so that nobody slips a different sample in and in place of one of these. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's NASA takes that very seriously and, and rightfully so. Um, so anyway, the, the, the samples that get out there for um, you know people to talk about selling, I, I, I pay very little attention to. And there's no real guarantee that they're lunar samples in the first place. Mm. Right. Definitely. It's kind of like what I worry about whenever I go to Meteor Crater and they, they have all the supposed fragments of the meteor. It's like, okay, yeah, but they're metal. And I know this because I was able to uh, test one of them using a, a magnet with a scorpion and resin on it. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's metal. It's It's pretty pure, but whether it's part of the meteorite, I don't know, and I'm hoping that Ryan will actually take one of them and, and put it in thin section and find out for us. Well, yeah, there, there's another issue there, and that's that, um, you know, even if you look at it in thin section, there's no guarantee that you can tell the difference between an Earth uh, terrestrial material and a meteorite. I mean, there are some telltale signs that would point to a meteoritic origin, but there are a lot of things where you could sell a, a, an earth-formed rock, pass it off as a meteorite, and it'd be very hard to definitively say, you know, what the difference right. is. 
which is which is one of those things where <laughs> geology office hours in the traditional sense of me sitting in my office in the in a geology department. Uh, one of the things that if you do this for any length of time is you get people coming in uh, with a rock saying, hey, is this a meteorite? Um, and, I mean, there, there's a whole terminology for meteorons, um, right. things that are not meteorites. And, uh, and then every once in a long while, somebody actually brings something in that is a meteorite, or at least has a really good chance of being a meteorite. So um, kind of live in hope for those days. Um, at any rate, um, yeah, I, I'd be I'd be extremely hesitant to buy anything labeled meteorite unless I had a real good idea who the seller was and and or the the chain of custody from the source. Right. Um, or if it only costs two dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and I know that some people have have you know tried selling some types of meteorites for really exorbitant sums. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I, I'd be real cautious about buying anything along those lines. On the other hand, seeing a fool and his money parted are <laughs> not so terrible a thing either. Any other thoughts? I think we're going to wrap this one up just from a length standpoint. Anybody else got any other Questions, thoughts? No, thank you. Hey, my pleasure. It was good to see a nice turnout today. Um, it's been really, really thin for the last two or three weeks, but um, it was good to see a nice turnout today, and hopefully we'll keep that up. Although with the holidays, I know it's not going to be. It's so going to be a little tough, yeah. 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 Nonetheless, we'll, we'll we'll carry through and. See if the spring semester takes us to new heights. Indeed. Okay. Definitely. Well, thank you all for coming. Good and uh, I'll be back on Thursday and again next Monday. Talk Sounds good. Thank you. Have a good evening. You okay, too, bye. April. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.